Maurizio Saracini and his pioneering work have brought together the worlds of art and science. Our speaker has helped to create and now serves as the director of a new UCSD interdisciplinary department which evaluates and pursues specific research projects and which investigates not only works of art but also unexplored projects involving architectural and archaeological artifacts. It is, a, it is with a great deal of pleasure that I present in behalf of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute a truly distinguished lecturer, Maurizio Saracini. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it's, uh, it's a great honor for me to, to be here to talk to all of you and uh, about a project that, believe it or not, it started right here at UCSD <coughs> many years ago. It was, uh, I would say, around 75, uh, 1975, and it was thanks to the, uh, the help <coughs> and the understanding and the support of uh, a special person that is here today, and I would like to have this privilege to thank Professor Walter Monk. <laughs> well, many years ago, when I was just a kid student here, and um, he uh, opened not only um, his house to me, but also he encouraged me to move forward this very unusual field, uh, art and technology binded together. Um, and I must say, it's with his help and uh, his understanding that this project was uh, indeed, it, it became part of my life. I'm very privileged to be here and to tell you about this quest that <clears throat> it doesn't, it shouldn't look like uh, an obsession, believe me, it's not. Uh, meanwhile, I've been doing other things and not just searching for Leonardo for 33 years. Um, which is uh, trying, for example, to uh, study uh, over 2,400 masterpieces so far, and, uh, and then about 600 um, monumental buildings, as well as uh, several archaeological sites just about everywhere. And that is, again, developing technologies and especially methodologies to, to do that, um, and uh, to give a contribution to the understanding of how the work of art uh, was created and uh, also to the understanding of the decay processes associated to these artifacts. I will try to go through some of these steps. Uh, obviously, the time is very short, <coughs> and so I, don't as, I cannot uh, go in depth for these different approaches uh, in art, architecture, and archaeology, but I will try to fly over a little bit and then uh, we will land, so to speak, on the project uh, for the search of Leonardo in the Holy 500. And in between, you might see a sort of a, a, a real, I mean, real time walkthrough in a painting as probably you had never seen before. And this is something that we have developed right here at UCSD for the first time. And it could, and I'd like to have your input after that, it could very well uh, be the, um, uh, the idea, uh, or I should say, it could show the way how works of art in the future uh, could be shown to the great uh, public and, uh, and, and create or a, a, an understanding, a better understanding, uh, that is today, which seems to me is somewhat passive, um, how a, a visitor going to a museum uh, is really posing himself in respect to the artwork. Um, there is a lot to be uncovered behind an artwork. Every artwork has a story, a visual story that is there, there and is the story of the genesis of the painting, is the story how it was created. And I think now we have the technology to show this and to show in a, even in an interactive way, as you will see later, 
So I really think this is uh, it's the beginning, even though after 30 years, but it's always a new beginning because this is an enormous field. Uh, there is so much to do and, um, and here at UCSD perhaps we could train the, the, a new breed of scientists that um, with an, an embedded uh, understanding of uh, arts and humanities, they could really uh, step up the level of um, conservation uh, knowledge that we have today, as well as really show us uh, a wonderful uh, world that is still there to be uncovered, even for the most best known masterpieces. Now let me just give you a, my point of view of how you address a work of art. We are so used to go to a museum to see a masterpiece. In this case here you see a detail, the face of the, of the pregnant lady by, by Raphael in Florence. Okay, you, are, uh, you see this, uh, uh, the beauty of the figure, the, uh, you know the Raphael painted it. So, but do you really see what Raphael did paint? Uh, do we really see the real thing? Or let me say, uh, <coughs> perhaps we should remember that when we look at a work of art, especially an old master, we are looking at a surface, because that's what we're looking at, which is centuries old, and therefore was, um, well, went through a decay state. It went through restorations. It went through uh, paint losses. It went through additional parts uh, sometime added by other owners, uh, by the wish of other owners, and so forth. So even uh, such an important, beautiful face, this is really what it looks like today. Meaning that this is what, how much has been added on the surface, and this is not magic. You just shine a, a UV light, an ultraviolet light, and you capture with proper filtering the fluorescence being generated at the surface. And what you see, those dots, are the retouching uh, done over tiny holes uh, that were the exit holes of, of woodworms that have been eaten up the, the wood support of the painting. And then they just, uh, once they got to the surface, they turned into flies and flew out. And so you first had to fill in those, uh, those um, uh, tiny holes with gesso and then repaint over and then restore, as you might see here, there are tiny uh, paint brushes, um, brush strokes, and then uh, brush over layers over layers of, uh, of uh, uh, varnish. So this just to give you an idea that it's really not all there <laughs> to be admired, and we should remember that we're looking at something so old that has been, uh, therefore, uh, some, let's say, changed and to which extent it's up to science to show. But let's take a, even a, a more important case, okay? You know, the, the, the beauty by excellence, uh, Botticelli the spring. So let's suppose now we want to see with different eyes than just our own eyes when we go to the Uffizi gallery and we see the spring. Let's say we would like to see the mercury a face and that's more or less what you will see even though this was taken at halfway through restoration way back in 1980. And if you see, um, if you shine a light, a uh, UV light, and then uh, it, mm, it, before the restoration, you might see all this greenish stuff that is indeed, it's, uh, it's varnish, oxidized varnish. Uh, and, uh, and then you see these stripes. And you wonder why you, know, you have these stripes. What are those associated to? Well, those are, and what you see here are definitely uh, not original paint, but it's added paint, uh, retouches, but retouches, why? Uh, uh, why do they take such a shape? No one will retouch, you know, in this way. Well, there is a reason, and it came out after restoration, that is, after this, um, this patina, I should say, and some of these restoration were taken out. If you compare the two, the two images, you might see that those uh, lines um, are even more evident, and they this time they they have a sort of a grayish uh, fluorescence, and this because the gesso ground under the layer of paint 
has been absorbing the UV light and so uh, since very little of the original paint is left along those lines, uh, there is a lot of absorption of the UV light along those lines done by the gesso behind, underneath the layer of paint. So in other words, what you're looking at is a damage that was done, we don't know when, uh, to the original paint layer because a, probably in the 19th century they brushed on solvent which it was too strong and so you see the brush strokes but unfortunately that solvent was not diluted enough and ate it up literally in other words de dissolved actually it should be more proper to say dissolved the binding media in this case the protein egg protein and so uh, it left these marks as if the painting, the original paint layer was removed, or at least partly removed. Because if we, if we were to see this, hardly we will appreciate this damage. So, this again is the, the spring by Botticelli, okay? So, not even this, the more, most important, more, most acclaimed uh, masterpiece of the Renaissance, as you see, is the way we see it. Okay, so that also should uh, make us think how fast and how much this wonderful art pieces are going through a decay process. And science, not only it's good to reveal them, but also to suggest, um, let's say, using a medical term, cures for them. And this is, should not be left only to restorers with, with their very uh, good hands and their experience, but like in surgery medicine, the surgeon, the restorer, should be uh, with uh, scientists, in this case uh, colleagues, uh, surgeons or doctors, <coughs> who will provide in, in real time why the restorer, in this case, let's go back to art, is restoring the necessary objective understanding of what his hands the restorer's hands are doing on the surface. Let's remember, when we talk about a paint layer, we talk about a few microns, sometimes 30 microns, 20 microns. So to expect that a human hand could have that type of sensitivity, uh, to be so, so subtle, uh, to know exactly when to stop, it's, to say the least, when we think about it, it's not feasible. It's not humanly possible. So the best that a restorer can do is try to do the least damage. But the moment he's doing, he's using his hands with no control whatsoever given from sci by science, well, it could happen, let's say. And I want to give you one more example and then we'll see some brighter side of our uh, of, um, uh, cultural heritage. Okay, Last Supper. I had the privilege to work an endless number of times on the Last Supper, trying always to show, uh, to be careful, not to, perhaps uh, we did not know enough, I'm talking about the uh, early 80s, uh, about how to go by and restore it. Maybe the risk was too high. I'll give an example. This is a very small detail. It's about five by six, uh, seven, no, five by seven centimeters, so very small detail of the Last Supper, okay? And you might see, you know, this is a different way to see the Last Supper, okay? You really go very close and you see that was before restoration, a surface that to say the least is far from being uh, readable and to be homogeneous or to be uh, intact. It's, uh, it's, it would be, if I were to ask even myself, how can you tell what is Leonardo and what has been added? <coughs> It sounds to me that it would be pretty difficult to be sure. You might guess. And then let's suppose we were to ask a restorer, okay, uh, you decide what is Leonardo, what is not, and then you take out what is not by Leonardo, because this is exactly what happened for 20 years. That's how long it, the restoration lasted. Well, then you might say, wait, is that all was done? Well, Unfortunately, there was not an equipe of scientists next to the restorer to provide the restorer with objective information every single day. Well, 
I give you one more example, and you see how difficult that is. I mean, each just particle that uh, of that heterogeneous uh, surface could be Leonardo, could not be, could be res uh, restoration put on top. When do you stop? How can you tell? Just leave it only to the eyesight. To, to my understanding, it's a little too risky. But believe it or not, um, it's still the trend among restoration. Uh, let's give you another approach to Last Supper and see these two images. One is just a detail, again, before restoration. The other one is a, what is called pseudocolor infrared image. In other words, this time you try to go a little inside, a little through, uh, because some of the paint becomes transparent in the, in the infrared region. And to take a picture uh, using, therefore, not the spectral, um, uh, um, the spectral um, range of, uh, of the visible, that is what we can see with our eyes, but we go a little to the right in the near infrared region and we take a picture and um, they are pseudocolors because uh, when I did it at that time uh, there was a film, an infrared, a color infrared film, and they had the same three layers of, uh, of, um, of film, um, but uh, gelatin, but not uh, it was the blue layer was missing, and so we had uh, the green, uh, the red, and the infrared. So the colors that will be they were generated, therefore, were not true colors. But why do I tell you that? If we are looking at the shoulder, both shoulders actually, at the gown, if you wish, of this apostle, you might see that it looks blue, but indeed, in the pseudo color, you have a red shoulder, his left shoulder becomes red, and the rest of the robe remains blue. Why is that? Well, that's the reason why we took pseudo color infrared imaging, because um, we can have a selection of pigments uh, which take different colors when uh, uh, viewed at this wavelength, uh, with, or at least, at least they, they take pseudo colors. And that's a way to optimize the difference uh, in, uh, in, uh, a, in a surface that looks the same. In other words, the blue of the coat was not done with just one color. It was done with two colors, the red being lapis lazuli and the, the blue being azurite. So this was a very easy, straightforward way to have, even though it's a qualitative information, but yet, to give you an idea. Now, why do I show you this? Because it tells you how the eye uh, can be really mis misled just looking at the surface that appears in the visible of the same color, but it's not. So how would you tell and how can you be sure that, let's say, which of the two could be it or is or was original? Maybe both were original, but at least the first thing you should do is just make aware that um, other modification could have taken care, uh, taken place, and you were not aware of. And don't trust your eyes either judging colors. As we know, the color, as, as this, the colors as we see it, is very subjective. Well, as I said, it's not all bad, and I don't want to, to sound uh, pessimistic about uh, the approach and how to improve our understanding of works of arts. So let's move to something more pleasant and more interesting, if you wish, less, a little, with a little less of technology behind. And uh, let's take this uh, painting, a Flemish painter, um, as anybody could see it. Now, it, it did have an attribution, and uh, good for the art historian that the attribution was confirmed. And what you see here is not a game, it's not a gymnic, it's actually a, an image, an infrared image, this time without adding pseudocolors, um, of what is under the paint. Let me go back. In this area here, indeed, there is a signature. Actually, it's more than a signature, there is a date. And it says also where the painting was done in Roma uh, in 1655, the 10th of August. Okay? So this is still there, has been covered. And simply using an infrared camera in this case, you need a longer wavelength to go through more thickness of paint 
and different colors as well, then that's how you can get in real time on a monitor screen uh, what could be a very important uh, feature of this painting. As well as uh, we should uh, now be prepared, and I guess through, throughout my professional life uh, at this time I, I'm not surprised anymore, <coughs> even studying masterpieces you find discoveries one after the other that not necessarily are in line with what we know about those masterpieces. So let's take the lady with the unicorn. The unicorn, okay? Well, all the symbolism that is related to this uh, 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 figure here, we call it the lady of the unicorn. Raphael, the lady of the unicorn. It's in everybody, I mean, in any art history book. But it's really so. Well, if we take an x-ray, the unicorn will turn out to be a puppy dog, okay? <coughs> and then if we want to go farther down the line, which means to go farther inside the painting, it will come out that Raphael never painted it, not even a dog, actually left the painting unfinished. There was no animal whatsoever. There were not even hands. So up to the waistline, uh, or I should say from the waistline down, including the unicorn, that painting was left unfinished. And uh, the columns were also added later and so forth. So it doesn't destroy our appreciation for a masterpiece, but science can provide you with some uh, objective understanding, which will put you in a position to better appreciate what you're looking at. Just recently, 2006, with a team of uh, young uh, graduate students from UCSD, we had the privilege to study the uh, Annunciation of Leonardo. Okay? So uh, this was a, a very special event for me to have the students brought uh, uh, to Florence and, um, and we were given the permission to study the Annunciation. It doesn't happen every day, believe me. Um, it's not so easy to really have such a masterpiece just for you to study. This is not something you can do in your lab, but you bring, you create a lab around the painting, whatever that painting is. That's another feature of technology that we are pushing forward. So um, we have, i give you just a couple of uh, examples of uh, some of the results. Uh, you see the profile of, um, of the angel and the x-ray underneath it will show that there is a different profile because there was indeed a change and this is the original profile by the way and this is one internally is the one that is now visible. So if we are going to place one next to the other it might become mm, uh, much simpler to understand what uh, is there uh, to be known. That is there has been a, a significant change in the layout of the head of the angel. I could be more specific, but probably that will require much more time to show you that what is called the opacity, or I should say the x-ray absorption of the, this part of the forehead when compared to this one here is totally different. In other words, this is whitish, this is more grayish, and this is due to the amount of uh, white lead that uh, was used to paint. So it's not only a shift of the forehead, but it's also a, an amount of uh, paint and also how the paint was mixed and therefore the percentage of the paint mixed with the binding media, which therefore it could indicate, we are in the process of studying the data, I mean we, we brought in uh, uh, a real large quantity of data about this painting, that it might be not only two moments, but maybe two hands. But let's not go too far. Let's see another detail of, in this case, of the gown of the Madonna. That's the way we see it. And then um, this is a pseudo color. And again, you see it becomes red because that gown was painted with lapis lazuli. But if we go further down in, inside, and we skip the pseudo color, then we'll see these beautiful lines, and that's the underdrawing of the folds done by the artist himself. 
Okay? So we are able to go back, to go inside, out all the way to the ground layer on top over which the artist drew the drawing. And this is there to be seen. It's a part of the genesis of the painting. And this is when the artist really, we know for sure, it was his work, his hands. <coughs> Where we are not never sure if what we see at the final stage, it was only his work or maybe his work with helpers. Because after all, these masterpieces were made in a workshop. And uh, the, the, the master obviously never worked by himself. So this just to give you an idea how much we can retrieve of what is still there. And remember, we're talking about very few microns. OK, um, I told you that we were going to have a sort of a live show. And it's about the adoration of Magi. This is uh, it's, uh, the biggest painting, by the way, movable object uh, on, on wood made out of uh, uh, nine, uh, 10 planks of poplar assembled together vertically made by Leonardo. And that was made in 1478. And the approach I gave it to, to this study, and it was amazing when I couldn't believe that uh, I was given this opportunity to study this masterpiece, and that was in 2003. I just followed the same approach as a doctor would, have, would follow for a real patient. So you have the anamnesis, which is the art history research, through the documents, archive documents, the critical fortune, that is the history of all the different attributions, the iconography and iconology, and obviously all the bibliography uh, search necessary to understand the past of this painting, to understand as much as possible what was done after Leonardo to this painting, and, uh, and possibly also to understand if anybody wrote about the uh, former state of conservation of this painting. And then the diagnostic imaging. They are, here are just some of the exams we went through, just like a doctor would do. And then based on the results of the, of the uh, reading of the diagnostic imaging, then we'd, we were allowed to do biopsies. Or if you want, let's call it, in, a, uh, in our field, they're called samples taken and cross-section of those samples were made. And then using uh, uh, Electron microscopy, XRF, uh, uh, micro Raman, uh, gas chromatography, and so forth, we were able to go down to each of those layers and understand what is there and how Leonardo uh, executed his masterpiece. So, characterizations of materials down to the microns. So, um, I, I told you about the imaging, the uh, diagnostic imaging, I just want to show you visually uh, what I'm talking about. It's like slicing the painting in a way uh, using different wavelengths and you go from the visible all the way to the 3D model. We build up a 3D model with a precision of a fourth of a millimeter. It was never done before. Nobody ever thought that uh, there was some sense of uh, creating a 3D model of a work of art. But it's very important if you make it very precise. Because in time, then you can compare if there has been some motion, there has been some change, there has been some structural change. And you also can not only measure it, but also identify where that happened. And so uh, here are just some of the wavelengths, and therefore the different images that we have built up. And then uh, we've done something that in medicine has not been done yet. And that is taking the different images uh, created with different technologies and uh, refer them to the same geometry so that you can overlap one on top of the other and then you can just go in and out and choose at which depth to stop and therefore to see and therefore understanding the real, the visual genesis of the painting from the ground layer all the way to the surface. What you're going to see is uh, it's a simple instinctive way to relate with the work of art. When you go to a museum, uh, you tend to get closer to, to the object just to see a little better, okay? Nothing more. But in this simple movement, if we introduce science, I should say technology in this case, 
and we make it uh, therefore interactive to our body motion, then what we can uncover, it's amazing. And what you are going to see is what is under the brown color, the monochrome color that today is visible on the surface of the adoration of Madhya Magi. And the way we gather that uh, information, that visual information, is using an infrared camera that um, we made and operates in the spectral range of uh, the middle infrared. So a little more penetrating than what you have seen with the pseudo color before, okay? And then we have taken hundreds, actually 2,400 images. We assemble them together and, and we paste them just behind this image. And now you're gonna see what we can see. First of all, as you can see, obviously we can zoom in and see details that simply will be impossible for us to see. But uh, we wanna start from the top left could you go up to the staircase? The way you see it today, it looks like a, a sort of a faded brownish surface, and especially on the staircase, what you see is there are a couple of uh, fellows sitting down, um, and uh, some others there are downstairs sort of uh, trying to uh, in interact uh, with uh, this guy that is turning his head and looking up, and you see ruins, basically. What was the message then? What was the iconology behind it? Well, the message was, at least up to now, let, let me say up to now, uh, that Leonardo wanted to depict a desperation in the world, um, a world in ruins, waiting for the coming of the, the new baby Christ. And so there was desperation and hope but really, it was a passive attitude. In other words, manhood were just sitting and waiting for something to happen and every, uh, around the destruction all, all around them. But let's see now, looking at the real Leonardo, and when I mean real Leonardo, at the work, at the drawing that he made, things might, will become totally different. So now, what he, all he does, is walk slowly toward the painting, as he would do. But this is what you see now. Now, that is the drawing that Leonardo didn't execute, that has never been seen for 500 years. And you can see that the message, the iconology, not only the iconography, is totally different. You see a lot of laymans. They are re reconstructing out of the ruins of that temple. There is a, a message of motion, of initiative, of a, uh, let's say, positive sense of, uh, of uh, belief, and all this waiting for Christ to come. And in addition, you know, all the details, incredible details, those are, in real size, they're about this tall, okay? So not only we were able to see them, but you see a what kind of a magn magnification. And you can see that everyone has an expression, a motion. And there is a search for the right position. It's not just one line. This is not a paint, is this is not a drawing that has been transposed from paper. It was born right here. So that's why in addition to being beautiful, it's so important that now we finally see it because it's the very, um, drawing that Leonardo created right there on the wood, on the ground layer of the support, the wood support. So now we move to the right, just to give you another example, by the way, and we go to the, the group of the horses and, and the horsemen. Um, this is another, it's another detail, very small. You can see there are patches of brownish, uh, a color there, there are rocks. You hardly see there are two horses sort of fighting each other and there are two horsemen there, but, and, and maybe you see a dog in between in the lower part. That's as much as you can see. Uh, but really, there is much more there. Um, I was searching for the laser, it's okay, the laser pointer. 
Uh, maybe I have it here. Um, and now he's going to work, uh, walk over and see how much you can really see there. Let me help you. First of all, out of this brown patch, there are a lot of figures there. Let me help you. See a head here? And this is the, his um, um, back and the, the knees and the legs. He's wounded. He's falling on the ground. There are a lot of uh, different uh, profiles here. One, two, and there is a third one here. A fourth one is here. And also this figure is trying to defend him himself from, uh, from a dead blow. And other horses, in other words, it's a real fight. It's a battle. It's not just a skirmish between two horses and riders. And then uh, you see other heads of horses here. Why just the head? Because you see a line. That's a line of perspective. There are several perspective lines in this, in this uh, overall creation. And then uh, let's go in order. You see here the ox and the donkey because this is where he plays the manger that otherwise is not there. And this is the pole, and this is the roof, and there is an elephant. <laughs> Why the elephant? The elephant because he uh, also wanted to paint epiphany, not just the adoration. And finally, can, you, can we go to a group of figures on the left-hand side? And uh, now you see this group of figures? They have been uh, considered faded, you know, just overcleaned, and uh, nothing more. Okay, so there's a group of faces, but uh, really not more than that. But if we go next to it, if we walk closely, we are going to see a collection of portraits. Each of them is a masterpiece. And you see, each of them is interacting with the other. They have different expressions, physiognomies. They talk to each other. They move. But this is supposed to be an adoration. That's pretty strange. An adoration normally is an aesthetic, still moment of a, you know, where everybody is there adoring the, the infant baby. And uh, nobody moves. Nobody talks. Nobody does e relate with each other. Everything here is emotion. It's the first painting where emotion was introduced by Leonardo obviously, I would say. Um, and there are over 70 figures never seen before. So and just imagine, you go to a museum, you pick up a painting, and you can interact this way. This is what I foresee as the beginning of a new approach to works of art. Obviously, you want to see the real thing. But don't you want also to understand how that masterpiece was created? Don't you want to see the several steps of that creation? Don't you want to know? And don't you want to understand? Because finally, you see images that you don't need somebody else to translate it for you. You just look yourself and appreciate. This is Leonardo at work. Now, you have seen those horses, OK? Now you see that it was a fighting. It was a battle scene. But that battle scene was painted, was drawn, I should say, in 1478, that is a long time before Leonardo <coughs> painted the Battle of Anguilla. Now you see the battle scene as you've seen before, the drawing, and next to it you see what is called the Rubens drawing of the Battle of Anguilla, or I should be more precise, of the fight for the standard. Incidentally, Rubens added color to this drawing because the drawing itself was done by an anonymous artist of the late uh, 15th century. But you can see the similarities. And indeed, Leonardo had in mind this fighting scene and kept it. And uh, therefore, when he had the chance, this great commission was given by the city of Florence in 1503, he introduced this just very fighting scene uh, in the Battle of Aguiari as the most important part of the, of the battle scene that uh, was going to be originally as big as three times as the Last Supper, and was going to show a battle scene that went through for an entire day over a wall 60 meters long. 
<coughs> so let's just move in fast from, uh, <coughs> on uh, the search for the Belle Vanguard. This masterpiece that disappeared uh, in uh, between 1562 and 1573 when uh, Vasari, the Medici's architect, was commissioned to remodel the Hall of the 500. And everything takes place right here in Florence, in Palazzo Vecchio, right behind the main uh, old Palazzo Vecchio. That's why it's called Palazzo Vecchio, this part here. And um, now we're going to see, for the ones of you, I'm sure just about every, every, every one of you has seen this wonderful Hall of the 500. And this is where the action actually takes place. So the job is, how can you locate or how can you prove, or I should say both, uh, if uh, the Leonardo mural is still there, hidden somewhere behind the Vasari's mural. Well, uh, this just to give you an idea, we have seen this already, and this is what Ma Michelangelo should have painted, but he never started. Uh, artists, some art historians say that he should have uh, completed the, um, the preparatory cartoon but uh, we don't have a trace of it. <coughs> we don't know uh, where, it, uh, how it was destroyed. And uh, in any case, that's all we have is this uh, engraving um, that is uh, uh, not, it's just a part, obviously, of uh, the Battle of Kashina, which was another big victory of the Florentine army, uh, in this case, over. Uh, the uh, the Chinese uh, the the Pisan um, uh, army, whereas the Battle of Kashina was a great victory over the Milanese army. Okay, uh, oddly enough, I know it sounds uh, like a curiosity, but way up here we found a flag with Cerca Trova, search you shall find. Now, uh, it's a coincidence, maybe. It just happens though that after years of, uh, of research. This flag, this inscription, not only is the only, only one, only inscription that is to be found in all six of those mural paintings. It's not to be, it's not visible from the ground floor um, and indeed is original. In other words, we had the permission to take a small sample of the white of uh, one letter and make a cross section and indeed there is no discontinuity between the green, between the, the, the white and the green of the flag. And finally, it just happens that it just sits over the area where most likely Leonardo uh, did paint the Bello Vangari. So they, that was found, by the way, in 1975. So that was the very first finding. Now, uh, we had a major task to do a 3D architectural survey of the entire Palazzo Vecchio and specifically of the whole the 500. And um, again, with uh, top technology and great scientists from uh, UCSD, actually Cal IT2 and School of Engineering, uh, we are now, right now, uh, in the process of gathering this enormous uh, 3D rendering of the whole the 500. We will go down to a precision of one millimeter. And this is what you see, it's just a very initial rendering of 5% uh, of all the billions of points that we have collected, shooting a laser beam and uh, pulse laser beam. This laser beam bounces to the object, it bounces back to you, and you measure, uh, since you know the speed, uh, and you can uh, measure the time, and the, you, you know the, um, uh, you can measure the time that it takes from the, from the, uh, to go from the, the instrument to the object and come back to the instrument, and therefore you then determine uh, the distance. And you place this, these dots, uh, millions of them, billions of them actually, uh, in space, and this is what you get. So you can then uh, zoom in and apply also real color images over those points, and you get a rendering that is beyond the imagination of what could have been done just a few years ago. And this is technology that we are using uh, right now. This was an early rendering of all the, it shows all the rooms have been attached uh, from the time Leonardo painted to, to today. And so we had to understand which was original, which was not, but without touching anything. So how you do that? How do you know that 
let's say one part of the hull is original or has not been changed from the original state when the, the gray hull, as it was called originally, was created in, uh, at, the, at the very end of the, of, the, uh, of the 15th century. Well, there is a way using a thermal camera that allows you to go through plaster, even painted plaster, and see the structure of the wall. Now look at this detail and see this. You actually see the, um, the image, the thermal image of the bricks. This is not a trick. Again, we are looking behind, okay? As we have seen behind a, a layer of paint, we see behind a layer of plaster. And we see very well all the bricks and the layout of those bricks. So that's very handy. Don't think it's so simple to do though. Um, first of all, you have to do it by night. You have to do it when it's very cold because you are detecting the heat emitted from the object and transforming this heat in an image. So you have to place yourself in the position when this very little heat coming from the, in this case from a wall, can very well be re-emitted in the environment. So the environment must be colder than the, 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 the little, the, the, the surface of the, of the wall itself. So we, we do it by night and then it's not just a single shot. Even this image here, it was 15 uh, thermograms assembly. But l let me show you, we are moving closer to the end. Let me show you what uh, uh, else we have done. This is uh, one of the, the major courtyard in Palazzo Vecchio. So let's suppose that uh, we want to understand, because we needed to understand all the transformation that went through in Palazzo Vecchio and finally in the whole of the 500, to understand what was the original layout, architectural layout, when Leonardo walked in and started to paint, just in order to understand where to search for the Bello Bangiari, uh, and not to be confused an area where a, a window could have been, or a door, or, or whatever uh, else, uh, uh, whatever other ch um, different uh, layout, architectural layout was there. So now look this. We just uh, using thermography, we are going through that plaster layer and we see the first layout of the 1299 done by Arnolfo di Cambio and this is how the two images look one next to the other. You see a lot of these windows refer to the original first architectural layout. So in other words, you see a page of, art, of architectural history before your eyes in real time. And that is a great boost to understand the modification the monumental buildings went through. But that's also, you have right here a very good technology and therefore a methodological approach in the interest of conservation. You should know first before you touch anything. And red is, we managed to do this in dozens and dozens of rooms, uh, thousands and thousands of thermograms, and finally what you see here in blue are all the added parts after the Great Hall was built uh, at the end of 15th century, and the, and, the, and the red is the original layout. But just to make it a, a sort of a, another walkthrough, this time it is, um, a walkthrough that shows a rendering, but every single detail we uncovered through objective uh, data generated by our technologies. So, show, you might like to see this. This is a walk, uh, we go up the staircases that we managed to, to locate, the original staircases. There is a document saying that once you get on top of the staircase, have a look at the wonderful horses of Leonardo. So we wanted to find those staircases. And therefore, we wanted to locate all the windows and doors, and therefore the possible location of the Bello Anghiari. So this is how it looked before Vasari actually remodeled it. Now, this is how the east wall, the one in front of you when you walk in the hall, the 500, will look like, uh, did look like, sorry, uh, after November 1504, because we found a document uh, showing that um, the windows on that wall were filled in. So when Leonardo started to paint in early 1505, the entire wall was free for him to paint. It was a huge wall, a huge wall, over 62 meters. And uh, we know now, collecting all the data that we have produced together with the documents, that this 
is the area where we should finally uh, concentrate, zoom in, to determine if the Leonardo Berlo Vanghiari is still there. And let me show you an assembly of thousands of thermograms, the entire 60 meters uh, thermogram image. And uh, just uh, to see it a little closer, so you can see how we were able to see that the lower part was indeed the original wall, and all this part was modified by Vasari, and you can see there is a total difference in layout, structural layout. And, uh, and the reason is very simple. We finally understood that the original wall had a ledge at a certain height, and Vasari uh, placed a, a stone wall, a stone frame on that ledge, and then he built his brick wall on top, and then he painted over the brick wall, and that's why this layout, this structure layout, is different from the lower part, as we have seen in thermography. But we knew that Vasari tried to save masterpieces when he could. So, and he did that, placing a brick wall next to the masterpiece and leaving a small air gap. So we said, maybe there is an air gap there. Maybe he has done the same thing. How do we find an air gap behind a wall, a tiny air gap? Well, we decided to use radar. radar and uh, we started with ground penetrating radar, then we moved to what is called, uh, well, uh, to a different uh, uh, frequency and a different uh, generation of radar pulses, and uh, we use what is called interferometric antenna. In other words, we increase the, the possibility to, to see very small um, uh, differences in, uh, in, in, in the inner structure of the wall, in this specific case, searching for an air gap. And we managed to find just behind the end of the, the brick wall, uh, a very strong signal associated to an air gap, just on the right side of the east wall. Remember where there was Cheka Trova? Right there. So now putting all the pieces together, you see the thermal images as you've seen before. Now you see the radar maps, this time collecting all the, the, the signals just behind the brick wall. Okay? So it's like if we had stripped down the, the brick wall and we see what kind of signals are generated behind that wall. And indeed, there is a very strong signal concentration right here. This is the right panel of the east wall. And this is where uh, we think the Leonardo da Vinci mural should be. So more or less, we are at the conclusion of our talk, even though i like to summarize it visually here. So we, there is the brick wall, the air gap, and possibly uh, the Leonardo's mural. Um, what's next? Well, we haven't solved the problem yet. Now we know there is an air gap. It just happens to be only there, and it just happened that could be very well be created by Vazel, just to protect the mural of the Leonardo. So now we are going to test, we are in, the, in the, the stage of testing a new technology, or I should say, a new technology applied to cultural heritage. It's called neutron activation analysis. We just send a neutron beam and we detect gamma rays. They are being generated at different depths by different materials inside, uh, behind that wall. We know all the pigments used by Leonardo because we found the, the, the documents specifying exactly which pigment and what was the amount of each pigment being used. So we are helped because now we know the chemical uh, components, uh, the chemical elements of those pigments. So this is the next step that is already started. We are in the feasibility stage now uh, of the project. Uh, just two words for other projects we are involved. It's a very important one and this time involves San Diego. San Diego Museum of Art and most uh, probably also the Timken Gallery to do the clinical chart of a work of art, like in a hospital, like for patients, collecting, doing all the tests, doing all the examinations, and then providing a virtual container uh, like you will do for a real patient, so you'll know how the work of art was made, what is the state of conservation at that very moment, and then follow up uh, with other tests uh, what is uh, the, the decay process uh, in, uh, from that moment on. That simple concept, you will not find one single museum today in the world who has done that, who has applied that idea of the clinical chart. Obviously, there is the drawback. You might also find some 
works of art which are not authentic in the process, by the way. <coughs> the other one, the great project we are involved, we got the permission by the authority in Florence to study the House of the Medici. Same procedure that you have shown you for the Palazzo Vecchio, we will apply to the House of the Medici. Uh, going back in time and trying to show how this masterpiece was built uh, and was modified throughout the centuries. This is where the Renaissance started. This is the main patron uh, house. This is uh, Leonardo, uh, Michelangelo, Raphael. They all were uh, paid by this patron, the Medici family. So I think this is a great tribute that um, we would like to give to Florence. At the same time, it's a great honor for us to be given this uh, great project uh, to, to, to go, uh, to do. And, um, and we're also involved in the digital archaeology uh, and specifically the Atlas of the Holy Land. And um, this is another major uh, undertaking that we are doing right now. Um, obviously, we have uh, a lot of other projects in mind, such as surveillance uh, of archaeological sites uh, uh, through multispectral imaging, satellite imaging, and so forth. But basically, I just want to say, as I said at the very beginning, I'm very proud to, to have this opportunity and to have it right here where all things started for me. Thanks to Professor Walter Monk. Thanks to all the great teachers I had. Uh, who taught me to think interdisciplinary, to open my mind and not just be channel, channel through just one single field, but search for answers everywhere they could be found. Uh, if you want to know more about what we are doing, uh, we'll be glad to, uh, uh, to be in contact with you if you were to uh, either pick up a brochure or leave us uh, uh, some references so we can update and we'll be glad to do so. I thank you so much for your time and your patience.